Okay, hey everyone. So welcome to um, part of the conversation we have on expanded journalism. So my name is Sibo Chen. So I'm an assistant professor at Ryerson University uh, School of Professional Communication. My name is Frau Kutzella. I'm associate professor in the School of Professional Communication at Ryerson University. I'm the director of this very interesting multidisciplinary project, Explanatory Journalism. And I'm also the director of the research focus Catalyst in the Faculty of Communication and Design. Let's take a look at the conversation, um, today's website. What are the main topics? I can see how COVID-19 is stalling careers for women and racialized faculty. Um, what the end of the Trump years means for girlhood. That, that sounds really interesting, both of them. And uh, the Buttergate, yes, I heard about this already. I was shocked when I heard about Canadian butter not being as good probably as we always thought it is, even mm -hmm. though we pay quite a lot of money for it um, compared to other countries. So uh, Sibu, what do you think? What would you read first? I have to admit, I first, of course, went to read COVID-19 and stalling careers for women and racialized faculty. What, what would you read first? Yeah, because, you know, I do research on environmental stuff. Usually I go to their environment and energy section first and, you know, basically read through, for example, on my screen and right now I'm looking at their environment and energy section. So the first article is talking about, you know, plastic is part of the carbon cycle and it needs to be included in climate change uh, calculations, right? So it's kind of along with this line of doing, you know, how to have a better understanding of the you know, the breadth of the climate change impacts. Then, you know, the second one is studying outbreaks of avian uh, cholera in Arctic sea ducks, right? So talking about, you know, issues around biodiversity. And uh, also we would like to mention about, you know, the podcast, um, which both of us have been following called um, Don't Call Me Resilient, which looking at um, Black Lives Matter as well as uh, racial racial justice issues. Um, I think that from there is already, you know, kind of suggesting something different, right? So I think for both of us, when we're approaching explanatory journalism, like the key research question is, you know, how to define explanatory journalism and how to, you know, kind of how to conceptualize, like what's the characteristic and how does it, what's its impact and how, you know, how does it engage with audience this kind of question kind of inspired our own research into it and from the front page we have seen so far we can see you know they are definitely kind of focusing upon crucial current uh, social issues but also in the sense that they want to plan provide that you know layer of explanation in the sense that you know they draw from you know experts to talking about issues they consider as important so, which, which is actually something, a feature or a characteristic that journalism always has been supposed to be doing, right? And has been doing from the start. Only here we find it in explanatory journalism focusing exclusively on this and using uh, uh, academics to help with that, basically, right? So experts from the particular fields, they try to explain. And uh, what, what I like about it is really I always... Uh, find interesting because I see things I like watching the news uh, in different countries actually and with the conversation Canada when I open it I always find the topics that I saw have heard about in the news but better explained in more depth and I really appreciate that and often I also find topics that are on top of that right um, that bring bring back certain issues that are quite relevant yeah you know because I mean I study from my own research, I have been tracing about media discourse, especially, you know, media discourse around climate change or around, you know, energy controversy for a couple of years. And uh, in a broad sense that, you know, what Conversation Canada is doing can be categorized as part of the, what we call alternative media system, right? They are, they are different from, you know, the mainstream corporate media or they are different from, you know, the public media model we have, like CBC. So, you know, for what really kind of started my research into it is really that, okay, so before, you know, getting to know about the conversation in Canada, I know that, you know, for alternative media, like National Observer, like um, Tai, so they have been 
looking a different model of journalistic um, objectivity and they have looking at different model for public engagement. So they have a much more transparent and much more, you know, strong stated uh, political agenda. So both of that, you know, that alternative media I have seen, they claim themselves as, you know, progressive leaning media and they explicitly want, you know, have this political mobilization dimension. So that has been, you know, one of the key features of many actors within, you know, the alternative media sphere in Canada. So for me, what really interesting is, you know, if we using the topic of climate change as one of the, as the central focus, then, you know, does it, you know, does Conversation Canada different from those media? And also more timely is, you know, since the, since the outbreak of the pandemic, how, you know, how did Conversation Canada engage with the topic, right? Given, you know, it has this kind of expertise, it has this kind of explanatory dimension and whether that will be, you know, showing some of the, you know, the inherent strengths as well as maybe potential limits for, you know, explanatory journalism. So that is kind of the major kind of research question I seek to answer. How about your research? That's very interesting and it's, what you're doing is very close to what what I'm doing and have done in the past and probably that's why we were put together in one conversation um, so yeah looking into how different media report on a certain topic that's something I've done quite a few times in the past and I really enjoyed and I usually use media frames or framing analysis as an approach to thinking about the news media as such an important feature in our societies and especially in democracies, right? And to basically act as a mirror for our societies and to show us what we think or we perceive as being relevant, but also pushing it in a certain way or re-emphasizing it by really saying, this is what is relevant, this is what makes the news. So I teach that always news values and um, also like, it, like looking into it. And then of course, with my linguistics and computational linguistics background, I like to use different methods um, to really then see how do they do that? How do they frame the news? How do they present that? Um, framing means in a way that certain topics or certain phrases, certain aspects, certain actors are overemphasized in a way without us noticing. So we do feel there's a certain media frame, there's a certain maybe scandal frame, maybe political frame, maybe economical frame. So and in this project, what I've done so far is to look into a topic that is um, it, a field I've been researching for a long time, so it's robot, robots and AI, and how this is being framed and reported on in the conversation of this, not just the Conversation Canada, but all English speaking conversation platforms. And um, what's interesting about the conversation, it's not just the text to look at them, because of course they differ, because the whole editorial style is very, very different but also the implications on the methodological side. So um, to do um, content analysis is, I found more challenging, or I found at least we have to revisit um, the traditional ways we've been doing it because the conversation has such a different style, rhetorical style. Is yes. that something you found too? Yes, yes, I agree because, you know, I also, using um for the project i did is basically i'm comparing you know the conversation canada with thai e with national observer with um so so with basically with other alternative media platforms and see you know during the first you know during during you know january to may 2020 right during the first five months when gradually we know the outbreak of covid 19 so th the different news items they published in response to the ongoing pandemic, right? So whether that has demonstrated um, different modes of, or different, ideolo I would say, editorial tendencies, right? So what they want to focus on, you know, what's the authors of these articles want to focus? I think one of the key difference, one of the key difference that so far I have found, you know, comparing Conversation Canada with, you know, those more established alternative media is definitely, you know, in terms of the author, because, you know, I think you know, a very interesting aspect of the explanatory journalism we have is on the one hand, you definitely, you know, have experts from all fields writing for the conversation. But on the other side, you know, they are they are not, not, not everybody is expert in terms of, you know, writing for the public, as well as not all of them are know in terms of, you know, writing your journalist style. 
so that you know we can see that it's always the responsibility of the editor trying to reframe the way the story is being told that's at least is my personal experience because i wrote for them before i i published one piece um there is another piece which is i'm i'm chatting with my corresponding editor so we are kind of making that put them it will probably appear within you know one or two weeks but basically throughout that process so you know i have my overall idea but you know hannah my editor she kind of replied to me say you know her approach to reframe the narrative then basically i followed her recommendations so i think that kind of you know very interesting is that you know you essentially getting professional expert but an amateur journalist and getting getting them tutored by professional editors and then you know you end up with you know all the conversation articles you read there so that will lead to what Froka you have said in terms of you know um style variations but also i think that that proves challenge for content analysis too is you know because of the very different research background and research interests that the authors have some people were writing on something very maybe very niche topics right so you know for content analysis is always about you know try to identify you know let's say news themes or content patterns from you know thousands uh, hundreds or even thousands of articles but sometimes you know you you cannot help but wonder whether you know we can we have to make those category very very small so that you know you can a, a, achieve a sense of you know consistency within one category which at least for me that's what 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 you know that's what I and my research assistant we have found can be very even you know for the topic of COVID nineteen that can be very challenging to achieve. I I agree, and I think the first time I heard about the conversation, the conversation platform, that's quite a few years ago. I was I I, I thought what a fantastic idea that is because um, knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization has always been and will always be really, really important. And it's, but it's also always been very challenging for academics to find a way, a channel basically to the public and to explain what they do, how they do it and what are the main outcomes. And very often also, to be honest, from my main experience, uh, from some experiences that I've been told, um, you know, some of the stuff that researchers do don't always sound like super duper exciting rocket sciences and yet it's really important research but it takes time for instance so it's very hard to turn it into something that everyone would feel really appealing and exciting and interesting and they would want to read about and that way that platform really opens up the opportunities right you don't feel um nobody's interested in what you're saying and instead you get an, an opportunity to showcase what you do to explain that but as you said with the help from the conversation editors, which is fantastic. And I think it's really important that we do research also on this platform, how it performs, how it works, um, because I see it as a really, really important tool also in the future for showing one more way um, of how researchers can really communicate to the public what they are doing. And now also with the podcast, which I find is fantastic. Um, the conversation puts so much effort into bring using different channels too, which is also quite relevant because I believe um, we have to do that in order to take into account how news perceptions and news consumption has changed over the past decades, right? So the, the importance, for instance, of visuals has become so, has increased tremendously over the past 10, 20 years, I'd say. Um, podcasts, ne nobody, I think, thought in the very beginning um, that this would be something that is still so and increasingly um, successful and influential. And um, so I'm just very happy that I get the chance to, to research on the conversation to really say, okay, this is a, such a relevant piece, additional um, media, news media piece for our societies. We need to simply learn more about it because as you and I both already found out, the style is different, um, the whole editorial concept is different. And so things that we know from decades of news media research don't necessarily apply, which of course makes it even more interesting for researchers like us to look into it. Yeah. And also, you know, when, you know, because I both doing research for, you know, conversation, but, you know, 
also, you know, I'm writing, you know, my own opinion piece for a conversation as well. And uh, I cannot help but thinking that I think another important issues emerging along with the process is whether these kind of, you know, alternative models offered for researchers provides, you know, new ways to conceptualize about, you know, knowledge dissemination, right? So what are the new channels for, you know, distribute the knowledge you produce and what's the better way to actually engage with the general public? I think, you know, the rise of explanatory journalism is in line with, you know, what we have experienced, right? This kind of, this is the increasing you get, you know, academic institutions actually also, also pro produce podcasts. And you also see, you know, the open access movement, which, you know, for the fundamental goal is to actually have, you know, basically making knowledge more accessible to the public. I really, I really feel that, you know, the way that I think the coming back or the kind of the rediscovery of podcasts is almost like a revenge against you know this overtly visualized world we live in on the internet on a daily basis. And sometimes people probably just experience too much visuals and they want to, you know, get away from it and you know find it going more for this kind of listening experience. That has been, you know, at least from my personal experience, that has been the case. Actually, the major way I get news in addition, you know, to reading conversation. And uh, actually, conversation the only news website with all the other news I get on a daily basis is actually I'm listening to the CBC podcast and uh, other you know news related podcasts that they're talking about you know issues in Canada as well as other parts of the world. So that has been my my way of you know keeping myself updated for news. But also I think that kind of shows the people you know if thinking. Of, about you know the way general public is getting their information these days so clearly i think people are shifting away from reading and uh, i don't think anybody would be interested you know if if they do not be pushed on the face with an academic article nobody will going to read that but you know i think definitely they will have a uh, you know they will have more interest in reading you know article from conversation and also i think one thing to point out is you know current i think conversation being republished by other you know, news websites as well, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. I think another thing that's important about it is you're right. So it opens up uh, um, a new avenue for the public to to, to read news. Um, but also at the same time, I think that the, the at least the baseline idea is that there's more um, equality in terms of who gets to what researchers Gets, get to say something to the public, right? So mm -hmm. when I grew up, basically, it's always, so news media uh, institutions, they usually have the go-to experts, right? When there's some yeah. news. So they call those professors usually at elite universities up and say, can you comment on this? This just happened, which is understandable. They have to provide news really quickly. The turnaround is really fast. So they can't just look up, you know, for hours, who, who else could say something about it? So. If you happen to work at one of those prestigious institutions, um, then it's very likely you get called up um, to, to comment, but not necessarily if you're a researcher and at just as good as other researchers, but you don't, the name of your institution or your background doesn't seem to be um, that popular among journalists. So you still get a chance though, then through this platform to basically speak to the public, to, to mm -hmm produce what you say in your standpoint. I find that really, really important because there has been, also in terms of EDI, there has been always in academia a big problem towards that you have to you have to publish in English, right? Um, to So your research is being recognized, which is quite, um, for, for many people in other countries, very, very difficult, often even unrealistic because, you know, hiring translators, that's, that's a, serious additional cost, uh, let alone know, knowing how the typical Western English standard, you know, um, article has to look like, um, what kind of language you use, all these kind of things. So I think, or I, I would hope that with platforms like the conversation, we also try to have a bit of a fair baseline situation for researchers of all institutions to say, I'd like, you know, I'd like my fair chance, put my pitch in here to the conversation. I want to publish something. Does that work? Um, yeah. yeah, and also, you know, just like thinking about, you know, uh, you know, for scholars as 
expert voices cited in news items. This, I think, one thing, I think one fundamental difference, you know, comparing the conversation with traditional mainstream media is who is actually in the driver's seat. And, you know, as we all know that as, you know, academia who actually got in the call from journalists, right? So most of the cases will be ends up, you know, you'll, you'll end up being, becoming, you know, two or, uh, three or four lines in the, in the item instead of, you know, you can provide a more comprehensive framework for your thoughts. I think that's kind of where the op opportunity has been opened. And uh, also, you know, I think the good thing, especially I think it's very interesting is about, you know, what you said, like the thing you have studied, right? Talking about AI and the robots. It's not like, um, you know, if you're writing an opinion piece on that, right? It's kind of difficult to, you know, sending it to mainstream news, especially when it's competing the space with, you know, you know more trendy political topics, right? But for science communication perspective, I feel that, you know, conversation is much more accommodating and because of, you know, the way, you know, the website, the, the organization position itself, right? It has more kind of di discursive space created for these more kind of niche topics within, you know, within kind of the, the OR kind of research area. So what I have found is definitely, um, you know, slightly more, especially compare, first of all is, compare with more kind of dedicated media like, you know, National Observer or, you know, Rubble or, you know, Tai -E. So it's slightly more depoliticized, right? So we know that, you know, for progressive leaning media like National Observer or Rubble, they, you know, they kind of framing COVID as part of a systemic crisis of, you know, contemporary society. So, and that kind of mobilized some of, you know, the comments opinion has been written there. But for conversation, so conversation definitely, you know, so far the authors have been putting a lot more efforts on, you know, risk and the science communication, especially explain, explaining, you know, pandemic science, you know, talking about, you know, what are the kind of broader scientific issues, debates behind, you know, testing, social distancing, those kind of matters. And um, also, I think on par, which is actually very interesting, is the similarity between, you know, the conversation with all the other of the last is their focus or actually their primary focus for all of these media is actually talking about the impacts you know what kind of the impacts of the covid and uh, um well we can see that you know for alternative media like Taiyi or national observer the, their critique is much more on this kind of you know the problems lying into the socioeconomic systems for conversation they try to, you know, kind of supporting those kind of critiques with a much more kind of theoretical take. You can see that when you're doing quality analysis for those kind of articles talking about the impacts, clearly, you know, articles on conversation is much more, maybe this is because of the author, because the authors are scholars, they write in the scholar style, right? There are more references and there are more kind of, they try to kind of draw in from research articles to backing up their arguments. And, uh, also a very surprising finding is, you know, on conversation is actually they're talking about history, culture and the well-being aspects, right? Because there, we have researchers, for example, studying health communication, study, you know, for example, loneliness, studying about, let's say, the psychological impacts for lockdowns, right? So those are the expertise that other alternative media don't have. So we actually see substantially more articles talking about that. Or, you know, you get historian talking about historically, you know, how pandemic ended, or, you know, how people coping with pandemic back to, you know, you know, back to the middle age, things like that. So that's, you know, very briefly for, that's what I have found so far. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. What I found is for sure that the typical, what I already hinted at, the typical or standardized media frames that we use in framing studies often don't work. So our, our coding, uh, manual coding actually, um, we train students as you, the way you always do that. You train them, you have them, some test codings. So that really showed that the typical media frames, so for instance, typical media frames are scandal frames or who benefits from something from a situation that is being reported on who are the victims all those frames often don't work or they at least they are much harder to detect than they are in typical um you know traditional news media articles which is as i said from a methodological point of view really um interesting at the same time if you want to conduct a study it's quite challenging and frustrating so we had to go back 
and change a bit. And we designed our own frames, basically. Um, what we found interest, what we found interesting and relevant, to, relating to topics like robotics and AI. Um, I never expected that because I've done these kind of studies so many times. And so, at one hand, I was of course a bit frustrated while we were hitting so many roadblocks. But now I'm quite happy because it is in itself an interesting finding, finding already, and that makes me also very happy in a way because I'm the director of all the sub projects here that we have at YSN and um, because we have put a lot of effort also into trying to detect or de define the rhetorical style of the mm. conversation where we use different methods, traditional um, social sciences based and humanities based methods, but also training um, machine learning pr um, programs, right, to detect certain patterns, certain um, standardizations that you can how you can describe the style and rhetoric of the conversation and it's really really difficult because as i said the news media lives from having certain stylistic features journalistic features so that people can really quickly and everyone at the same level basically um, read the news um, process the news understand the news the conversation follows a little bit a different idea it's still they want people to be able to process and read and understand the news um, but they also want to explain a lot more and that takes i think that asks for a different kind of language yeah um just one quick uh, you know follow-up question I'm, I'm i'm curious did you see an increase of articles talking about you know automation following you know the outbreak of the pandemic i think you know i read a couple of news that talking about for example in the future this is kind of interesting, right? Because, for example, in Japan, I know that they they help helping the trend, like they create robots to taking taking care of the elders. And there has been more discussion saying, right. should we follow that trend? No, not not that necessarily. However, mm -hmm. because robots and AI has always been a really important and hot topic, and especially AI um, based robotics in the past five to ten years. But what we did find is that, so we looked at the articles and do compare then articles published before COVID and articles published after basically January 2020. Um, definitely the, the frame um, of technology as objective. So when we, we frame technology as being objective, as being not potentially negative, that definitely has increased. Yeah, because of now we feel that um, we do need robots to help because robots can't get COVID, right? Um, yeah. That that was a very interesting finding for sure. So that we did find, we did find differences between how this kind of technology has been framed um, before COVID and, and ever since COVID hit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think we are running out of time, almost. Yeah. And uh, so I think um, so. Just like this is, you know, for both of us, this is kind of an interim reflection of what we have got so far and definitely we are looking for you know getting the full results out during the summer and yeah. uh, hopefully you know for those of you actually watching the video you will join us later when we you know have the results published thank you thank you all yeah thank you for watching our video mm -hmm.